Hello everyone, if you're Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. As you can see by the title and the thumbnail, I have indeed activated my wildcard off the back of the double game week information that we now have. So in today's video, you will see my latest wildcard draft. You'll also have my opinion around the upcoming double game weeks, my current chip strategy as well, and much, much more. And if you do enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button. And if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, I'm not entirely sure this will be the most coherent video you've ever seen from me, mainly because I'm just so excited at the moment about FPL. I know that sounds very, very nerdy. I'm fully aware of that, but I just love this point of the season. Chips are so fun for me because it requires the most strategizing, and especially when it's quite difficult to strategize, which it is at the moment, given the way the doubles have fallen, that makes it even more fun for me. And even if you don't have all of the chips, right? I'm very lucky that I kept a lot of my chips. I've been patient, but even if you don't, it's still fun. Even if you've got no chips left, think about how can you get the best team out each week without taking too many hits and deciding when to take those hits. So this is a fun point of the season for me, but it does mean I'm like an excitable child at the moment. And therefore it might not be perfectly coherent. And I've also not recorded a YouTube video in about a week. So putting those together, I apologize if I speak even quicker than normal. And I apologize if I'm not perfectly coherent, but what I thought I would do at the start before we jump into looking at the fixtures in even more detail than this, I thought I would go through it at a basic level. Which teams are doubling when? And what does this mean for FPL? I've actually got, for one of the first times ever in my life, notes next to me about what I want to talk about with respect to the teams that are doubling and the fixtures that are coming up, because I don't want to miss anything. But if you do think I have missed anything, let me know down below. And just let me know what you're doing at the moment. Chip strategy wise, transfers, what are you currently planning for Game Week 30 and beyond? So... This lovely graphic from FPL underscore Spaceman, I just love it. I love a Venn diagram anyway, but I think it perfectly encapsulates the problem that we've got with these fixtures and how we need to think about approaching it. So what he's got on the screen, as you can see, is the purple circle is double in Game Week 34. So the teams that are doubling in 34, we've had that officially announced. And because we now know which teams will double in 34, We've got a very, very, very good idea, pretty much confirmed idea about which teams will double in 37. And we now have pretty much good confirmation about a small double game we will have in 35 and 30 or 36, I should say. Just to note, there are currently seven teams that will not have, unless there are any more postponements, which there shouldn't be, any more double game weeks this season. And those are the teams that blanked in 29, or sorry, that played in 29, apart from Spurs. So Aston Villa, Brentford, Burnley, Fulham, Luton, Forest, and West Ham will have no further double game weeks this season. So those seven teams, if you're looking to target the doubles, and there is a conversation about do you have to target the doubles, but those seven teams will not double again this season. They'll also have covers, of course, not blank as well. So after that, we've now had confirmation around the double game week in 34. So that's the only thing that the Premier League have officially announced. And we have seven teams doubling in 34, which is Bournemouth, Palace, Wolves, Sheffield United, Liverpool, Everton and Arsenal. Now, we were not expecting such a big double game at 34, but of course, because Wolves lost to Coventry and Liverpool lost to Manchester United, therefore we could have the likes of Liverpool, Arsenal, Wolves doubling in 34, which changed a lot for us. So now double game at 34 is actually the biggest double game of the season, not what we thought would be double game at 37. So seven teams now doubling in 34. And because we've had that announcement, we now have a pretty good idea slash confirmation about which teams will double in 37. And it will be six teams doubling in 37. So what we're now looking at in 37 are some pretty good teams doubling, although the fixtures aren't great, as we'll discuss a bit later. But Brighton, Man City, Man United, Newcastle, Spurs and Chelsea will be doubling in 37. So therefore, what that looks like is seven teams doubling in 34 and six teams doubling in 37. The issue that we have, and we've been discussing this for a while, this is not new news. And if you aren't or weren't aware of this, it means you should have been subscribed to the YouTube channel because we've been discussing this for a while, which is the fact that no teams double in both 34 and 37. They are seven completely different teams doubling in 34 to the six teams doubling in 37. So therefore, if you are sat there without a free hit or a wild card, you are going to struggle. If you've got both, you are in the perfect position. But if you have one, I still think it's possible to navigate because you essentially need two different teams. You need a team for 34 and a team for 37. So those are the two big double game weeks coming up. But we also see, as you can see by the other circle, we have actually a double game week in either 35 or 36. Very likely we think to be in 36 instead of 35, but it could be in either, which is a double game week for Chelsea and Spurs. 
Therefore, Chelsea and Spurs have a double in one of 35 or 36 and 37. So you could call it a double-double. All right, so Chelsea in 35 or 36 and in 37 will be doubling. The reason for that is Chelsea have two fixtures to rearrange. So they have to double two further times this season and they can't double in 34. And Spurs are now blanking in game week 34, which is really interesting. I don't know why they bothered to do this, but they did. So Spurs are now blanking in 34, which means they have an extra fixture to rearrange, which will be the one in 35 and then obviously the one in 37 too. Hopefully that makes sense. So you can see on your screen what that means to the fixtures. So now I'm going to refer to my notes. And at this point, I'm also going to bring up the schedule from Ben Krellin. So that was a really basic version of what we have regarding the fixtures and which teams will be doubling when. This is the spreadsheet from at Ben Krellin. Please go follow Ben. He's absolutely brilliant. He pretty much predicted this almost spot on. I mean, there were a couple of things wrong, but largely this was perfect about a week ago. So well done to Ben. Brilliant work. Please go give him a follow at Ben Krellin. Let's now discuss a few things. So I've got some notes here. The first thing I would say is if you free hit in 29, this is this is good. Because I think a lot of people free hit in 29 because they had, maybe you've got Arsenal players, maybe you brought in Bournemouth players. So a I think a lot of people that free hit in 29 and aren't wildcarding soon are probably sat there with two or three from Arsenal, two or three from Bournemouth. Maybe you've already got one Liverpool in there or you're looking to bring in Salah anyway. You can probably comfortably get to nine or 10 doublers without a hit for game week 34. So free hit 29, whilst it didn't work out for you, is looking pretty good now that I don't think you need a free hit in 34. I'll discuss in a second. I think it's still pretty strong, but you don't need a free hit in 34 anymore. So those people that are on free hit 29, wildcard 35, bench boost 37, this couldn't have gone much better for you. So I think this looks absolutely ideal for those of you that are looking to wildcard after game week 34. And what you do is you dead end into 34. You bring in the likes of Liverpool, Arsenal, Bournemouth, Palace, Wolves. They've got double game weeks and a lot of them have okay double game weeks too. You bring them in, you dead end and then you wildcard out of that. So if you free hit in 29, the saving grace is that 34 looks easily navigatable without a free hit. I think if you aren't free hitting in 34, whether you've already used it, you want to save it or whatever... I, d I think pretty much it's pretty obvious you go for Liverpool and Arsenal, right? They are two of the best teams in the league. They're fighting for the league and they both have okay doubles. Liverpool have Fulham and Everton both away, which isn't ideal. And Arsenal have Wolves and Chelsea. So this is pretty great, I think, because six of your doublers can be from two of the best teams in the league. So if you have like Saka, Havertz or Odegaard and Gabriel, and then you have Salah, Darwin and a defender of some kind, Virgil van Dijk, Bradley, if he's still in the starting 11 at that point, Kelleher could be an option you're already sorted. Add a couple of other doublers in there. You seem looking good. So I think if you're not freeing at 34, the priority this week should be Arsenal and Liverpool. But given the fact that Arsenal play against City, it's probably Liverpool. So go out there and get Salah. Go out there and get Darwin. They are worth bringing in even for a hit because look at the fixtures up until 34 and then they have a perfect double game week. So basically, I think if you've used a free hit already, you're still in a fine position because 34 looks easy to navigate. Having said all of that, free hit 34 now looks very strong because of the teams that are doubling. We were looking at before of having like Sheffield United, Palace, Newcastle and United as the only teams doubling. Now we've got loads of players to choose from. I might go for like Luis Diaz, Darwin and Salah. I might go for Havertz, Erdegaard and Saka as a triple up on the Arsenal attack. We've got the likes of Eze and maybe Elise if he's fit. You've got some decent options like Eight Nuri and Muno, Munoz, 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 who knows, the, the defender from Crystal Palace. There are some really good options to choose it for free hit 34 now. So it's like, it kind of suits everyone. It suits if you've already used it, but it also makes free hit 34 look really strong because I can choose 11 seriously good options now. So that's around 34. What else have I got here? I'm just having to read my notes. Not particularly professional, I'm aware. Right, I want to discuss Chelsea and Spurs because I think this has a massive impact now on what strategies work and certain strategies being a lot weaker. So let's say you're looking to wildcard around now, 30 or 31, and I'll discuss in a second which week I think is better. I think a lot of us were thinking, do you know what? Bench boost 34 could be a potential because you're bench boosting closer to the wild card, which means there is less potential of stuff going wrong. And also we knew there would be some smaller teams doubling. And the reason I say that's good is because you want weaker, cheaper players on your bench. You want to be able to bench boost like Palace defenders or like Wolves attackers like Cunha, very, very cheap. So when you actually look at the fixtures in isolation, game week 34 looks much better for a bench boost than 37. Let's ignore all of the other fixtures. Just looking at those two, definitely 34 is a better bench boost than 37 because look at 37. You've got teams like Man City, Man United, Chelsea, um, Chelsea Newcastle. They've not got that many cheap assets, maybe like a Lascelles and a Garnacho, but I actually think in isolation, 34 
is better for a bench boost. The issue that we've now got is the Spurs and Chelsea double in 35 or 36. Because Chelsea play Arsenal in 34 and Spurs have a blank. So if you are to bench boost in 34, you can't have any Spurs assets, firstly. So you would have zero Spurs. And really, you don't want many, if any, uh, uh, Chelsea assets. You might have Cole Palmer. So I think if you're to bench boost in 34, you are going to have Palmer. And that's it from Chelsea and Spurs. If Chelsea and Spurs then double in 35, let's say, you are going to go into 35 with one free transfer, probably, maybe two, and only one asset from those instead of a potential six. And again, you don't have to have a double up from Arsenal, I'm sorry, from Chelsea and Spurs because the fixtures aren't that great, but you probably do want at least like Son, Palmer, Gusto, maybe a Pedro Porro or something like that. So it's very, very difficult. Even if it's in 36, you've then got, only got an extra transfer to try and get them in. So bench boost 34, unless you're wildcarding in 35, I just don't think it really works because you're not going to want Chelsea and Spurs in 34, but you are really going to want them in 35 or 36. And then, it's not just that double in 35 or 36. Remember, Chelsea and Spurs also double in 37. So I think now, given the fact that Chelsea have Arsenal and Spurs blank in 34, and then they have a double-double, probably in 36 and 37, I think that therefore just makes bench boost 34 not an option, unless, like I said, you've got a wildcard to use after that. Therefore, I think if you're looking to wildcard soon, or you've got a bench boost and a free hit to use, for most people, I would imagine that free hit 34 and bench boost 37 makes a lot more sense because what you can do on your wild card now is you can have triple Chelsea and either double or triple Spurs. So five players from Spurs and Chelsea. The next few fixtures are nice for Chelsea and Spurs. You can then free hit them out in 34, have them for the double in 36 and have them for the double in 37. And then in 38, Chelsea have Bournemouth at home and Spurs have Sheffield United away. So I just think five players from Spurs and Chelsea or maybe six will just sort you out perfectly for the remainder of the season and you just free him out in 34. So I think the way the fixtures have now fallen, it doesn't fully rule out bench boost 34 for me, but I just struggle to see how you would make it work given again, Chelsea and Spurs having the double-double and also having bad fixtures in 34 or a blank. But if you think you can make it work or you just don't think Chelsea and Spurs are that important to invest in and you're happy having only three or four or taking a few more hits, then you could maybe make it work. So I'm not trying to put you off fully, but I think if you've got wildcard free hit bench boost left, I certainly think the most obvious strategy is to wildcard this week or 31 to then free hit in 34 and to bench boost in 37. The final thing that I did just want to discuss is around wildcard 30 versus 31 because I think a lot of people clicking on this will be people that are looking to wildcard and therefore you're probably thinking... 30 or 31. I myself have been talking about 31 for a while. You'll, you'll see that I've been pretty sure that I wasn't going to wildcard in 30. The reason for that is based on the projected fixtures. I didn't think Spurs were going to be worth investing in massively. And most of the wildcard 31 drafts that I thought about building had zero Spurs. My issue with that is on my current team, I have three Spurs assets against Luton at home. And I was like, I'm going to be wildcarding out three Spurs assets against Luton at home, including maybe Hyung Min Son. Why not just wait a week? On top of that, I thought I would have lots of assets from Arsenal and City and they play against each other in 30. So I was like, if I'm going to have three from Spur three from Arsenal, three from City, why not just wait until they've played each other and do that in 31? On top of that, Liverpool's best fixture is in 31. So I can wait until 31 to decide which players to have, etc., etc. Ollie Watkins plays against Wolves in 30. So there were loads of reasons that I was just like, wildcard 31, 31 just makes more sense to me. And some of that stuff does still apply. But the changes now... Based on the way the fixtures have fallen, I think two or three Spurs still makes a lot of sense. So I think immediately I don't have to lose all three of my Spurs assets. I can still have you doggy or Porro, and I can still have Son as a minimum. On top of that, I would obviously have triple Chelsea against Burnley, which I think is great. I can still have double Liverpool against uh, Brighton at home if I want to. Potentially, you can only have one. You can have as many as three, which you'll see in my wildcard draft at the moment. I think I do have three. And therefore, I no longer think that my wildcard 30 team is going to be that much worse than... Oh, I should also note Man City and Arsenal was the final thing. I actually only have, I think, two from Man City and Arsenal, which is going to be a big criticism you'll have of my wildcard draft. But I will try and explain that throughout because I don't think you necessarily need tons from Man City and Arsenal at the moment if you are free in 34. But I'll discuss all of that. So therefore, I look at my wildcard 30 team and I don't think it's any weaker than my normal team for 30 without the wild card. I actually think it's slightly stronger. So that was the main thing putting me off. I think the only thing is if you drop Ollie Watkins, you obviously lose the fixture against Wolves at home, but I'm gaining other really good players as well. It's not just I lose Ollie Watkins. I gain someone else in that spot. 
So I now no longer think that 31 is much better than 30. And the other thing to note is price change as well. There actually haven't been many over the international break. But if I do wait for... I, by the way, Game Week 31 is a midweek deadline. So there isn't as much time between 30 and 31. But I'll maybe lose like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 million. And this kind of money is going to be important at some point. We want Haaland and Salah. We maybe want Son in there as well. You want Saka. You'll see in a second, I'm struggling for budget. A lot of people are really struggling. So... 0 0.4 million is quite a lot. So I think if my team for 30 is going to be maybe slightly stronger with the wild card, I don't think my team would change too much between 30 and 31. I'll gain some value as well. For me, I'm just looking at it now and thinking wild card 30 just makes a lot of sense. But if you are really happy with your team in 30, just go in 31. That's absolutely fine as well. Don't feel like you need to. And maybe if you think you would have three or maybe even four or five players from Man City and Arsenal, and you think, I'd rather wait a week, and maybe you don't want to load up on Spurs. Like There are some reasons where you just genuinely might not think that your wildcard 30 team will improve your team this week. Just wait until 31, because you might get extra information. And it could be that the team you choose in 30, we get some extra information, a couple of players get injured, and maybe the 31 team does differ. An extra game week of information isn't a bad thing. So don't feel like you've got to go this week. But when I compared it, I think my team gets slightly better for this week. I save some money, etc., etc. I don't think unless there are injuries and other issues, my team will change that much between 30 and 31. So I have activated the wild card. So just to recap this incredibly rambly and long section, if you're still with me, thank you. My plan is wild card 30, free hit 34, bench boost 37. It will get me a really good team over the next few weeks. It allows me to get a really good team in 34, of course, with a free hit. It will give me five or six doublers in 35 or 36 when Chelsea and Spurs double. And I will probably have 13 or 14 double doublers for 37 for the bench boost and a really strong team in 38. I don't see where it can go massively wrong other than the amount of time between my 30 wildcard and my bench boost in 37. Because that is a long time. If I pick five or six players that all end up being rotated, rested, and there's suddenly minutes risk, and I get a few other injuries, it could be that my bench boost is basically like null and void. It's just not particularly usable. I have to just play it despite the fact that I don't have 15 good players. That is the only risk. Other than that, I think it's a really good strategy. So let's take a look at the draft. So I just spent a long time rambling. So here is the Game Week 30 wildcard team. I'm going to discuss all of the different players. Just to timestamp this, I'm recording this very, very late on Sunday, ready for a Monday morning upload. And I'm sure my opinion will change throughout the week. And I would be surprised if this is the final team going into Game Week 30 because I'll think about it a lot more as well. But as things stand, I'm currently lining up in a 3-4-3. I have 1.4 million in the bank. I have really good team value. Considering my rank is, I say only, very like only 94k it's not a brilliant rank my team value is actually very very good it's up there with a lot of people that are like top 1k top 5k so i'm very happy with my team value so you might build this and not even not even not have money in the bank you might not even be able to afford it so there might be some spots to downgrade even something like saka to Havertz. Maybe you wouldn't necessarily love that, but there are spots in this team where you can downgrade quite a bit. You could go for Richarlison instead of Son if you think he'll get good minutes. So it's not difficult to make the downgrades, but there will have to be downgrades if your team value isn't great. Based on the team that I've built here, as you can see above my head, this is, of course, a wildcard 30, free hit 34, bench boost 37. Without any transfers, this would, of course, give me 11 doublers in 34 because I would free hit. So I can have as many doublers as I want in 34. Without any transfers, it gives me five doublers in game week 36, which can tell you I've got five players from Chelsea and Spurs. And I think, at, as things stand, I think I've got 10 doublers for game week 37. So that means I've got five players currently in this squad that are not doubling in 37. But do remember, you don't have to have 13 doublers on a bench boost. I could have like Salah who's got, I think, Aston Villa away. That's absolutely fine. Don't have to have 15. But also, I've got loads of free transfers between now and 37. Obviously, I don't want to use all of them on selling single gaming players for double gaming players, but I have the opportunity across the coming weeks to sell my single gaming players for my doublers. So that's the way the team currently looks. Currently rated at 95% according to Fantasy Football Hub. As per before, I've got some notes to the side, which isn't necessarily notes. It's other players that I've considered at points and are at least worth discussing why I don't have them in the team. So starting with the goalkeepers, pretty much all of my drafts have had Petrovic and Onana. And the reason for that is on a bench boost, I do ideally want both of my keepers to have two fixtures. So in game week 37, we've spoken about the teams that we can choose from. And I just think when you're taking into account price, when you're taking into account save potential, and when you're taking into account other assets you might want to own, a Chelsea and a Man United keeper doesn't seem like the worst idea. 
No, they're not the best defences. But apart from game week 31, when Chelsea and Man United play against each other, the fixtures rotate really nicely between Petrovic and Onana. And again, they both give me a doubler in 37. They both give me a double game week. So I like them for that reason. They're not too cheap. They're not too expensive, I should say, at 4.5 million for Petrovic and 4.8 million for Onana. So I think they are probably, on paper, the two best keepers to go for if you want to guarantee right now that the two keepers you pick will have a double game week in 37. So therefore, I like it. And obviously, Petrovic this week has Burnley at home. Onana in 35, I believe, has Burnley at home as well. You've got Sheffield United in 33 or 32 for Petrovic. So you've got some really, really nice fixtures in there. However, there are some other keepers that I've considered. So here are Brighton. Brighton, do you know what? If Verbruggen or Still were fully nailed, I would have them in there because they're very cheap and they'll probably make quite a few saves. And Brighton have been pretty good defensively this season. The issue is they rotate. The Zerbi rotates for Bruggen and Still. And whilst I think Verbruggen is more first choice than Still, he's definitely the favoured keeper, in double game weeks, you need them to play both. And unless we get an injury to one of them, I just wouldn't feel fully comfortable there. So that's why I've not got a Brighton goalkeeper. Edison is always an option. The issue with Edison is he's very expensive. I can't afford Edison. Well, I could instead of one, but if I make some other changes, Edison becomes... He takes up a lot of budget. And when he doesn't make many saves, and also City don't keep that many clean sheets... I'm not fully sure how I feel about Edison, but it would be nice to get a Man City. As you can see at the moment, I don't have a Man City defender here. So I like Edison, but he's a lot of money for what he offers, in my opinion. You can see that he's not the top scoring keeper. I think actually Onana and Leno are the two top scoring keepers on points. So I just don't think Edison is value for money for me. And then the only other option that I've considered is Kelleher. As you can see, I've got Bradley in the 11 now because I like the immediate fixtures for Liverpool. But it is booking in a transfer. If you go for a Liverpool asset, unless it's Salah, who you're probably happy having on a bench boost, if you want to have a doubler in 37, you're going to have to take them out. And I don't want a bench boost with Kelleher against Aston Villa in 37, even if, and that's even if Alisson is still out at that point, but we're expecting Alisson to probably be back. So whilst Kelleher is really nice and really cheap and you get some really good fixtures, it's booking in a goalkeeper transfer at some point. And I just always feel like they're fairly low upside. And what would that goalkeeper transfer probably be? It'd probably be to bring in one of Petrovic or Onana. So why not just go for them now? So that's the reason why at the moment, most of my drafts have had those two because they both double in 37 and the fixtures apart from in 31 when they play against each other, the fixtures do rotate fairly nicely. Let me know what you think down below on that goalkeeper rotation. The defense I'm actually really struggling with. Three of these players have been in every single draft. Gusto, just brilliant. I mean, he passes the eye test, underlying attacking data is pretty good. Chelsea aren't a poor defense. They're kind of middling, maybe pushing towards the top half. So I'm not saying that I'm expecting tons of clean sheets. And I'm aware this gives me a double up some weeks of Petrovic and Gusto. But this week against Burnley at home, I'm fine with that. And he carries so much attacking threat that I think it's worth the pump. Lots of people will say, what about Reese James? Reese James is expected to be back late April based on the current information that we have. But will he take significant minutes off Gusto? I'm not that sure. And on top of that, even if Gusto does become a rotation risk, I'll play Gusto most weeks between now and like 35, 36 anyway. So if Gusto does become an issue, maybe I have to sell him. But I think I'll get so much from him in the coming game weeks that it's still worth going for him. So I think Gusto's got that upside. He's got the fixtures. If he is still first choice then and James isn't back, he's got the double-double in 36 and 37. Gusto is just a great option for me. So therefore... Gusto has been in every single one. I do like Dezassi. I think he is relatively now, but he doesn't have the same attacking threat. And I still don't think he's fully, fully, fully now to the point where he won't miss the odd game. Whereas I think Gusto, without James in the team, kind of has to play unless they want to play Dezassi at right back, which I suppose they could do. But I think that's getting into overthinking at stage. Gusto's just a great option. And with the doubles coming up, I like him. You Doggy has been in every single one of my drafts. I love Pedro Porro. I've had Porro for a lot of this season, but he is a bit more expensive. I'm saving like 0.7 million going for You Doggy instead of Pedro Porro. So whilst I could afford Porro on this team, and I might do, by the way, I've not sold Pedro Porro yet in my actual team because I've got money tied up in him. And if I've got all of this money sat here, maybe I just go for Porro. But You Doggy's attacking data recently. He's actually been better. And he's decent for bonus points. I think he's got more goal threat than Porro too. And so whilst I do think Porro is a marginally better asset, is he 0.7 million better? I'm not so sure. So at the moment, I've got you doggy, but I do think I will have a Spurs defender given all of the things we've spoken about thus far. Romero is fine. Van de Ven, when he's fit, is fine, especially considering how cheap he is. But I do think I'll have one of you doggy or Porro. Could I have both? Potentially. But I don't know if I want to double up on the Spurs defense. And again, Pedro Porro instead of a Bradley, I can't afford that. 
that is a big, big upgrade in fun. So I'm just struggling to get both of them into my team. And at the moment, I am favoring you, Doggy, for the savings. The third and final defender that has been in every single one of my drafts is Lascelles, who's currently sat on the bench for me. The reason I like Lascelles is, again, he's got that double game week in 37. The fixtures outside of 37 are very, very good for Newcastle too. And Botman, is, as I don't know if he's torn his ACL, but he's got an ACL injury, so he'll be out for the remainder of the season. So whilst they could do something like burn at centre-back and Livermento at left-back, Lascelle should be relatively nailed for the remainder of the season now. And I love that. 3.9 million. It feels like a bit of a gift. And again, if I find out that Lascelles isn't now, well, then I'll have to take him out. But it feels like a gift on wildcard, considering all the, the other expensive players we want to squeeze in to have Lascelles. So therefore, Gusto Udoggy Lascelles, they give me three doublers in 37. They're cheap. They're attacking, at least for Gusto and Udoggy. They feel like really good picks. So the three of those have been on pretty much every single wildcard draft. But the other two spots, I've genuinely got no idea where I'm going to end up going. At the moment, I've got Bradley and Eight Nuri. I'll start with Bradley because he's in the starting 11. People will look at this and just think this is an awful decision. But hear me out. I don't think there are any defenders outside of Diogo Dallo, and I'll explain my issue with Diogo Dallo in a second because I really do want him, outside of Dallo, that double in 37 that I want now. I've spoken about I could double up on the Spurs defence, not great. Do I want a third Chelsea defender alongside Petrich and Gusto? Not particularly. Man City defence, I don't mind the likes of Ake. Could be decent, but is he fully now? Will he play all of the games in the double? I don't know. So I don't think there are any outside of Dallo who I would want and there is an issue with Dallow, that double in 37 right now. So if I can't have a player that doubles in 37 right now, I therefore have to go for a short-term punt over the next few weeks that I'll eventually move to a, a defender that doubles in 37. Maybe later on that will be Ake or that will be Dallow. So at the moment, that is Bradley because of the short-term benefit. Brighton and Sheffield United both at home over the next couple. Yes, there is the risk that he doesn't start Sheffield United because he, he wants to be, because he's saved for the Manchester United game in 32. But it feels like he's got pretty high upside over the next couple if he does start them, and I expect him to. Yes, Trent could be back fit from 32, but we don't know that. And will he be rushed straight back in? Who knows? And even if he is brought back in, is there a potential that he picks up another injury or reaggravates it? There is. So Bradley is just so cheap. He's got short-term potential. I love that fixture in game at 31 against Sheffield United at home. And therefore, I don't mind taking a short-term punt on him. I've looked at my planned transfers with the attackers I've picked. I've not really got any transfers I desperately need to make in 32 and 33. So if one of my transfers needs to be Bradley to another defender, so be it. So I kind of just like the idea of a short-term punt on him. That's, that is generally the only reason that he's in there. And then the other defender I've got is 8 Nuri. This is a slightly longer-term punt, but again, a player that I will need to remove before 37. So I am booking in transfers here, but I, I feel like the most important thing here that I've realized when I'm building these wildcard teams is 37 is only one week and it is so far away. Who knows what will happen between now and then? Who knows which players might get injured? If Haaland or Salah get injured, loads of money freed up, I can get whoever I want. So you need to weigh up on your wildcard 30 and 31. You want to, of course, think about your bench boost in 37, but you don't want to sacrifice the short-term gains by going for players like Ake instead of Eight Nuri will save me maybe a transfer down the line. But is Ake going to do that one in 37 that it's worth going from over Eight Nuri now? I'm not so sure because... Eight Nuri just looks something special at the moment. His attacking data is outrageous. He passes the eye test. The fixtures are really good for Wolves. Even if you ignore the fact that I'm free hitting in 34. So the double in 34 doesn't help me. Outside of that, they're brilliant. He plays against Burnley next week. He's got attacking threat. Wolves aren't an awful defense, especially at home. And on top of that, the fixtures are there. So I quite like Bradley and Eight Nuri because it's balancing me out of, I want to, like I said, think about 37, but I also want some short-term gains too. So eight Nuri, I just think is a really nice option. And he has been in an increasing number of drafts for me at the moment. So that's the defense. I've just made a note again of some other defenders that I've not thought about. So Ake, I like him. I've had Ake instead of Bradley, which means I start Lascelles this week in a few drafts. He takes up a lot of money for, again, like I said with Edison, Ake just, he doesn't offer that much. Bonus points potential, not that high. Attacking threat higher than other City defenders, but not that high. He's a lot of money, and City aren't keeping that many clean sheets. And in the weeks that I need a defender, Ake often doesn't have the best fit. Like this week, I'd like a decent defender. Ake's not the guy because he's got Arsenal. And do I think Ake will definitely start both in 37? Especially if Guardiola's fit in 37. I'm not so sure. So I'm not sure Ake's getting me that much. 
Pedro Porro, like I said, he's good, but I can't have him instead of Bradley, so it'd be instead of eight Nuri. And do I want to double up on the Spurs defense and remove myself the opportunity to go for a Madison or a Richarlison in the future? I'm not so sure again. So therefore, Pedro Porro, I don't think is a perfect option. Dallow. Let me discuss Dallow. I've got Onana, and spoiler alert, I've got Garnacho. Dallow would be a third Man United asset for me, which I don't have an issue with. But I think I'm going to want Hoyland in 37 because I think the forwards are going to be very tricky to pick three good doubling forwards in 37. So I think Hoyland's going to come in for me in 37. If I go for Dallow as well and Garnacho and Onana, I'm blocking myself from getting Hoyland. And I think I would therefore have to make another transfer to remove one of those three United assets or just go without Rasmus Hoyland, which I don't think I'm going to want to do. So therefore, Dallow becomes an issue for me because he's blocking that third United spot. So Dallow, therefore, isn't perfect. The only other remaining defender that I've not discussed, and everyone will just go, just pick them. Don't be an idiot. They're the best defense in the league, is an Arsenal defender, and it is Gabriel. And I have had Gabriel in quite a few of my drafts. But I look at the fixtures. Apart from Luton in 31, none of them screen clean sheet to me. And remember, I'm free hitting in 34 when they have the double game week. So Man City this week, I think it's Brighton and Villa after the fixture against Luton. I will then be free hitting in 34. And after 34, most people that are bench boosting in 37 will sell Gabriel anyway. If you're wildcarding in 35, I can promise you, not promise you, I can guarantee that I don't think you'll have an Arsenal defender on your wildcard in 35. So if I'm saying the only real fixture that I'm jealous of is that Luton at home fixture, well, Bradley's got Sheffield United, eight Nuri's got Burnley. I would back both of them with the attacking that they have to not necessarily outscore Gabriel, but to at least potentially match him or outscore him. So if the, in the only week I want Gabriel, I think there are other good cheap options I could go for. I don't mind the idea of backing against the Arsenal defence. So as you can see, I don't think there are necessarily great options in defence. It is one of the issues with wildcarding now, but I think Gusto, Udogi and Lascelles are pretty locked in for me. Could be Poro instead of Udogi. And in those final two spots, could be Bradley Ate Nuri, could be... Poro, potentially Dallo could go in there, Ake could go in there, or Gabriel, or some potential other options that I've not discussed here. Let me know what you think down below of the goalkeeper and defense situation. Let's move on to the midfield. Oh my goodness, this is going to be a long video, but I've just got so much to say and so much to explain. So you know, just kick back and relax, and hopefully you are enjoying the slightly longer video. So for the midfield, this might be a little bit shorter, actually, because four players are just so incredibly locked that I haven't even considered taking them out. Parmesan, Salah, Saka, they're brilliant. Right, All four of them on penalties, all four of them elite assets, and all four of them have fixtures in certain weeks that make them just obvious options. Palmer and Son are just so obvious on my strategy because I don't need them in 34 because I'm free hitting, and they have the double-double in 36 and 37, and they are the two best assets from their teams. So for me, I don't need to sit here and explain this. We'll save some time. Palmer and Son are absolutely locked in, and they have a great fixture at home this week. And you could argue the two best captaincy options potentially in game week 32. So those two absolutely locked. And Salah for me is locked as well. Yes, I'm obviously free hitting in 34, which is when Liverpool double, and he doesn't double in 37. But the fixtures between now and 37 are just so good for Liverpool that I'm going to want Salah anyway. Especially next week, he's the very obvious captaincy option. I've actually got my armband on him now. I may well captain him in 32. And therefore, I don't think the fact that I'm free hitting in 34 should put me off of Mohamed Salah. And I may well bench boost in 37 with Salah as my only single gaming player. I don't mind the idea of having Salah on a bench boost. I mean, he'll probably outscore a lot of double gaming players anyway. So Salah is very, very obvious for me too. I think Saka out of the four is the least obvious. As I spoke about, the fixtures aren't perfect for Arsenal. And I'm free hitting in the double game week anyway when I can get Saka back in. My, my issue with Saka is he's just so good. I just think even if the fixtures aren't perfect, he's still brilliant. I mean, there's an argument to even play him this week against City because do I expect Arsenal to score? Yeah, and Saka will probably be involved in that. So there's an argument to even have him play him this week. And so for me, Bakayo Saka is just such an, not an obvious player to have, but it's such an easy pick. And when I look at the fixtures, I don't think they're great for Arsenal defence considering some of the attacks that they're playing coming up. But for Saka, the defences that they're playing, they have been susceptible to concede him. So I think there is justification to go without Saka on a wild card this week if you are free hitting in 34. But I just don't think that's a that's I don't think that's a battle that I want to take on. You have to pick your battles in FPL. You will see in a second. Spoiler alert: I've sold Ollie Watkins, and I've actually sold him, so I can't have Ollie Watkins now because I had money tied up in. So Watkins is gone for me. That's a battle I'm happy taking on. But Saka is not one. So Saka is in there too. So Palmer, Son, Salah, Saka nailed in my wild card unless something drastically changes. That fifth spot though. Could be a few different players. I've got Garnacho at the moment. Not necessarily because I think Garnacho is a perfect player to have. 
But with the fixtures, with the double, and with the other players that I want to squeeze into my forward line, I can only go up to a certain point. I think I've got 6.3 million to go with. So if I go with the current forward line and defensive situation that I've got, I can't have someone like a Madison. So Garnacho is in there because the fixtures are decent in the weeks that I need him. He offers me a really nice option as an eighth attacker, my cheapest attacker, really good value for money, and the double in 37. So Garnacho is a very, very good FPL option. And I do think he is not completely nailed, but I'd be surprised if he's benched anytime soon. So Garnacho's in there. The other player that I could go for if I wanted to with this exact same structure because I have 6.3 million is Anthony Gordon who has a better fixture this week and arguably better fixtures than Garnacho for the remainder of the season. My issue is the weeks that I want Gordon, he doesn't have the best fixture and the weeks where I would like to bench Gordon, he has a pretty good fixture. So Gordon actually, when I've looked ahead to future weeks, creates benching headaches for me and doesn't serve me as well in the weeks that I need him, whereas Garnacho is the opposite. In the weeks I don't need Garnacho, he's got tough fixtures against the likes of Chelsea and Liverpool, and in the weeks that I need him, he's got decent fixtures. So I quite like Garnacho because he just fits my, my team a little bit better, and he is cheaper, so he does offer me the money to, to make moves elsewhere. If I need to upgrade Bradley, I've got the money to do so now. So I think Garnacho makes a lot of sense more so than Gordon. And then the only other players that I could go for, for me in, in that spot there, is a Spurs midfielder, so Madison and Richarlison, because as I said, Spurs and Chelsea just serve you so well on this strategy for the remainder of the season. My issue is if I go for Madison, I have to drop one of my forwards and I really like my three forwards. So I'm not as keen on that. I could find a way to maybe squeeze Richarlison and keep my forwards, but I would have to probably sell Onana, I think it is, to make it work, which I'm not as keen on. And my issue with Richarlison, is he fully nailed? Because they've got Werner, they've got Johnson, they might want to play Sonny through the middle. Even if they play Richarlison through the middle, what are his minutes going to look like? He's no longer on penalties when Son's on the pitch too. So I don't think Richarlison is a bad option. And if he is starting as the number nine for Spurs, he might be the option that I go for. But I'm not sure I want to go for him now. And that then moves me on to the final thing around Spurs and why I'm keen to leave that third spot open. I don't know where I want to go with that third spot. It might be that I decide Porro is just so good. I want to get Porro in as my third. It might be that Van de Ven looks decent, gets a couple of goals. And I'm like, you know what? They're aiming for him from corners. Maybe I go for a cheap Van de Ven. Or what is more likely, I'll go for one of Madison and Richarlison. But if Richarlison is getting good minutes, I think I prefer Richarlison to Madison. So I almost want to leave that option open for me. So what I'm currently planning is Saka to one of Madison or Richarlison, potentially in 36. And if I don't do that, maybe I do just go in with only two Spurs assets for that double, potentially. So that is why, at the moment, the midfield is Parmesan, Garnacho, Salah, Saka. Don't fixate on me playing Garnacho instead of Saka. I might well, and I could well, and I probably will play Saka instead of Garnacho. But I really do like that midfield five. Parma, Son, Garnacho, all double in 37. Salah and Saka are the two that don't, but they serve me well in the lead up to the game week. Sa Salah, I'm actually happy bench boozing in 37. And Saka can be sold for Foden, Madison, Richarlison, any, Gordon, Gross, any number of options that double in 37. So that's the midfield five. Let's move on to the three forwards and discuss the team in its entirety. So guys, moving on to the three forwards, they're all at home and oh, I'm so excited about this front line. I'm not going to lie. Haaland, I don't think is essential this week. And I was very happy going without Haaland against Arsenal. But on him, now that I can get him in and I will, it is at home. And I think there will be goals in this. And we know that Haaland struggles massively against big six teams away from home. His data and output is really poor. If this was Arsenal away, I would consider starting with like Ollie Watkins and then moving to Haaland next week. And I do think that's quite a reasonable strategy, by the way. But given that it's at home, I just back him and I just want to get him in place now. I don't think he's even in the top five captaincy options for this week, personally. But I do think it's worth having him in place. And I am very happy that I've now got a structure with Son, Salah, Haaland, Saka, and some expensive... I mean, this team looks very, very strong in the attack. So Haaland is in and I will have him. A few people have messaged me like, are you tempted to go without Haaland? Because obviously I... I didn't pioneer the strategy in game week eight, but I was definitely one of the main people going without Haaland on my wildcard in game week eight. And a lot of people did the same strategy and it worked quite well for a point, but I don't think this is the point to do it. City have everything to play for. The league is very, very tight at the moment. The fixtures are pretty good for Man City as well. And they double in 37. I would be very surprised if going into double game week 37, the league is wrapped up. So I think Haaland is an absolutely exceptional option. I'll probably catch him in 37 too. So I just think for this spell, it makes sense to have Haaland. I've got Darwin in there as well. You guys know how much I love Darwin. Any opportunity to get him and I will. And that does complete a triple up on Liverpool, which 
I know it isn't perfect considering they don't double in 37, but as I said, I want to find that balance between, yes, 37 is important, but it's not the only game week. If I get 100 points every week between now and game week 37, I could have a stinker in 37 and still be pretty happy. So I don't want to fixate too much on that with this wild card. And I think Liverpool's fixtures coming up are really, really good. Next week, if Bradley, Salah and Darwin all start, so I have triple Liverpool and Sheffield United at home, I really like that. So I think Darwin's immediate fixtures are good enough. He's got Brighton, Sheffield United, Manchester United, and then Crystal Palace, I think, is the run of fixtures. Then I'll obviously free hit in 34. I may well take Darwin out in 35, or I could even keep him in place there. So I, I really like Darwin as an option. I think that Darwin will become Hoyland between 35 and 37 is the current plan. So that's what I'm thinking around Darwin. Really like him as an option. I'm assuming that he's going to be fit and available. By the way, Saka Gusto Darwin, I think they'll all be fine for 30. Love Darwin. Then the final spot is actually Isaac. And I would argue one of the players that I'm most excited about owning, given that I don't usually get the chance to own him. So Isaac is now fit. How long for? We can only imagine. So Isaac is now fit and Wilson is not. And I think anytime you've got one of them starting and fit and the other one is not, they are always a very, very interesting option. The short-term fixtures are great for Newcastle, but then from 35 onwards, they're brilliant. I think he's got Sheffield United at home in 35, a double in 37. If Wilson is out for the remainder of the season, which we don't know, he could be back slightly sooner than that. Isaac is just brilliant. And if I end up needing to remove him because he gets injured, I have the option of moving to Hoyland. I have the option, if I want to, of maybe selling one of my Chelsea assets and moving to Jackson, who I'll discuss in a second. So it's not the end of the world if Isaac gets injured. And I think it's worth the risk for me. So I am planning on going with Isaac. I like the fixture this week against West Ham at home. Not the best of defences, West Ham. And like I said, the fixtures moving forward are really, really nice for Isaac. His data is just so good. When I, like I'm a data-driven manager. Haaland, Isaac, and Darwin's underlying data... He's just so strong. It's very difficult for me to look away from this front three at the moment. So I do have Haaland, Isaac, Darwin. So that is the starting 11. Just on some other forwards that were obviously worth mentioning. Ollie Watkins isn't here. I love Ollie Watkins. He's brilliant, but I have sold him and he will not be on my wildcard draft. I think he's great. And he is, has proved this season. Fixtures aren't overly important for him. In fact, he's actually performed better in some of the more difficult fixtures. And he's obviously got a great fixture this week against Wolves at home. He could very much punish me. But on my strategy, I just don't think he's one of the best forwards to pick. I would argue that he's like sixth or seventh for me in the pecking order because I, I love fixtures. I will always target fixtures. He's got Man City and Arsenal in 31 and 33. He's got no remaining double game weeks too. I just think there are better forwards to choose. I prefer the three that I've got and I prefer some other ones as well. So he just won't be in there for me. I think he, again, I think he's great. If you want to start with Watkins and move him on a little bit later, I, I absolutely don't mind that. Rasmus Hoyland is definitely in my consideration. The reason that I've not gone for him now is I think I, I could go like Hoyland and Gordon rather than Garnacho and Isaac. I don't think I would want to go for Isaac and Gordon or Garnacho and Hoyland, but I could mix it up slightly. But I just think Darwin to Hoyland makes sense a little bit later when the fixtures re from 35 onwards, the fixtures are really good for Man United. I think they've got Burnley at home in 35. By the way, I'm doing fixtures all off the top of my head. So if I've got any wrong, I, I apologize. But I think they've got Burnley at home in 35. And from, from then on, really nice fixtures for Man United. I think Darwin to to Hoyland around then makes a lot more sense than going for Hoyland now. I just think the immediate fixtures aren't really there for Manchester United. So that's the current plan on Hoyland. Jackson, I love him. My issue with Jackson is he's on nine yellow cards. So he, he's one yellow card away from a two-game suspension. And I just think Petrovic, Gusto, Palmer is a really nice set of three players for so cheap. I mean, think about the price of Petrovic, Gusto and Palmer in combination to get three Chelsea assets with the double-double and the fixtures that they've got. I don't love double Chelsea defense, but I think it makes sense given the pricing that we've got here. So I like Jackson, but the nine yellow cards and the fact that I think those three Chelsea assets are better value for money means that he's not been in too many of my drafts, but I certainly don't mind taking a risk on him because he's looked very good recently. Who else have we got? Solanke? Brilliant. No issue with Solanke. The fixtures are definitely there. I'm free hitting in 34, so I can have Solanke for the double. And therefore, I just think there are slightly better assets to target. I like Isaac long-term and I would prefer Darwin to Solanke myself based on the way that I play. So that's why Solanke isn't in there. And then the only other option is Muniz. And this is more of a combination thing. I think Muniz this week against Sheffield United is great, by the way. I'd like, I'd like to have a Fulham asset against Sheffield United. 
But I don't think he's better than Isaac or Darwin. The only reason I would have Moniz is if I wanted to go for Madison instead of Garnacho. So I've built this draft almost exactly as it is on a few occasions, but instead of Garnacho and Isaac, I've had Madison and Muniz. And I would love to know down below, do you prefer that? I have one less doubler in 37 because I'm losing Garnacho and Isaac for Muniz, who doesn't double, and Madison. And I also just think it makes my team structure weaker because I think it, I then am stuck with Muniz and not a lot of money to upgrade him to another forward that doubles in 37. So I, I like it. I actually think arguably this week, I would much rather have Muniz and Madison than Garnacho and Isaac. But I feel like it sets me up a little bit worse, having one less player in a slightly weaker structure. So I think I've settled on this for now. Guys, that video has been far too long. I do apologize. I'm going to leave it there. I'll, I'll, I'll leave kind of looking forward for later in the week. When I do my team selection, I'll show you what this team looks like in 31, 32, 33, and show you what my current plan is because it does look very strong. But I just wanted to get this out for you on Monday morning to show you the rough team that I'm looking at. So the key take home thing, if you are looking to wildcard this week, you want three Chelsea. I think their fixtures are just too good considering the doubles as well. I think you want at least two Spurs, maybe three. So you want five or six from those two teams. I think you probably want at least three or four players from Newcastle and Man United. I've got Onana, Lascelles, Isaac and Garnacho. You could get away with two, but I don't think you want any less than two given the fixtures. And then I also think you want to have a bit of fun attacking the upcoming game weeks. And I think that's where my triple Liverpool, Saka and eight Nuri serve me quite well. I think that's a decent summary of it. Let me know what you think of the team down below. So guys, there we have it. That is my Game Week 30 wildcard draft as things stand. Hopefully you stuck with me to the end. And if you did and you're not yet subscribed, please do consider subscribing. Make sure to like the video if you enjoyed it as well. Let's aim for 1,500 likes. And until next time, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.